quintessential small Midwestern town in the midst of a really surprisingly attractive part of southwestern Wisconsin. And this is where the Parker family established their roots when his parents, Norman and Jane, were first married, 1847. It was a great place to grow up. George's, despite the fact that the area was popular for lead mining back in those days, George's father was a nurseryman growing and selling trees. Uh, but like anyone back in those days, there was an incessant urge to move west. And so in 1871, when George was just seven years old, the family packed all their worldly belongings into a covered wagon and headed 100 miles as the crow flies in west into northwest, northeastern Iowa uh, through the town of Dubuque across the Mississippi. Uh, the family remained there uh, for forever, basically. Uh, it was a great place for George to grow up because it was a bigger town with more going on than Schultzburg. It had schools. Uh, it had everything that he could need. Well, not quite. When he got to be 18 years old, the handwriting was on the wall. It was pretty clear both to George and to both of his parents that he was not cut out to be a farmer or even a nurseryman. In fact, the real dilemma facing George was that he was interested in so many things because he was famous or perhaps even infamous within the Parker family for one simple characteristic, his curiosity. It was incessant. It was <coughs> never-ending. It was maddeningly incessant, in fact. He asked questions about anything and everything. He would not hesitate to ask a perfect stranger a question. He was just a very curious young man. And with that in mind, he had seen enough stories in magazines about the world out there, outside of Fayette, Iowa, that he decided he wanted to see more of it. How to see it was another problem. <coughs> but he decided that he would learn telegraphy. And so he traveled to learn telegraphy to a little town not too far from his birthplace in Janesville, Wisconsin. So there he was in Janesville, and uh, he learned telegraphy. He was promptly hired by a railroad and went out and uh, was a line tel telegraph operator for one of the major railroads. But while he was doing that, he found that the company that he was working for, the, the telegraph school, wouldn't pay him as much money as he wanted to learn. So he began fixing pens. And it took off. It, it became really, really popular. So eventually, the business grew and grew and grew so that he married. He had two boys. And he continued to work on ways to make better pens. In 1921, he hit upon a great, what would become a great pen, the Parker Dual Fold. It was very, very successful. And then in 1933, while he continued to, to seek out ways to make better pens, the Parker Vacuumatic was developed. And then in 1937, at the age of 73, George died. But he had taught his sons the business well, and so his son, his younger son, Kenneth, who was my grandfather, took over the business and developed the next improvement in pens, the Parker 51. 
Okay, so there you are. You now know everything there is to know. <laughs> Certainly more than you could find out if you looked at Wikipedia. But the reason I'm here today is not to talk about such simple facts as these. It's to go into the personal side of Pence. So, to do that, let's start with whom I'll call Curious George, this incessantly, relentlessly curious young man who wanted to see the world. That was his single focus. He wanted to see the world. There weren't many opportunities for him to explore the world from Fayette Isle. So George read all the time. Both his, uh, most of his sisters had been teachers, so they taught him to read at a very early age. George also discovered when he was quite young that there were no strangers in the world. There were only people he hadn't yet met. In these ways, he fed his curiosity. But it seems as if the more he fed his curiosity, the more compelled he was to go out and see the world. So when you wonder back to his decision to become a telegrapher, it sort of makes sense when you read this ad and you learn that telegraph operators who worked for railroads back in those days were given free passes for travel on the railroads. I have no doubt that that's the real reason George wanted to become a telegraph operator. It didn't necessarily feed any of his interests except the ability to travel. So, his first assignment was to a place that he very politely referred to as nowhere in the midst of the Dakota Territory. Let's just say that uh, nowhere was not on his bucket list of places he hoped to see. He was actually quite chagrined and almost despondent that he would be stuck in nowhere, Dakota. But good luck struck when the managers of his telegraph school back in Janesville invited him to return to Janesville and teach telegraphy. Well, that wasn't exactly on George's bucket list either, but if it meant that he could get out of nowhere, Dakota, well, he was on the next train, and back in Janesville, and teaching, and, and relieved to be back in a more uh, worldly place. Yes, Janesville may not sound like the center of the world, but it was a vast improvement. So, the only problem that George could figure out with his new life as an instructor was that despite his best efforts, his incessant best efforts, to convince the school to pay him more money. He couldn't do it. You might wonder, well, why did he want more money? Uh, it wasn't because he wanted a, a new suit or a, or a bigger room to, to board in. It was because he wanted to start building his travel fund so that when he had the opportunity to travel, he could start seeing that a beautiful world out there that was beckoning. Well, they, they, they wouldn't give him his raises, and so he decided that the best way he could get around that was if he asked for permission to sell pens to his students. The managers probably looked at that decision and said, well, you know, if, if it keeps him from asking for raises, I say, yeah. Go ahead and sell some pens. And so he became a sales agent for uh, the John Holland Pen Company. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, uh, I think that is probably a measure of the quality of pens that they made. They didn't last such a long time. But it, but it did get George on the road, or at least initially. He started selling the pens, and he was feeling quite encouraged that his travel fund was growing and that he was going to be able to travel. 
everything looked, well, rosy. Um, until, that is, his customers, his students, uh, came back to him with complaints that the pens that he had sold him were leaking, they were scratchy, they were skipping, they were, they were just awful pens. Uh, so with that in mind, George was faced with two choices. First, he could give them their money back and preserve his reputation as an honest man, or he could figure out how to make the pens more elaborate. Well, it really wasn't a choice, because there was no way he was going to give up his travel fund. <laughs> so he went out instead and bought some hand tools and started experimenting with ways that he could make these pens better. And, and he did. It wasn't that difficult. As my grandfather would say many years later, a fountain pen is, after all, a controlled leak. Yeah. It's very true. It's very true. So George fiddled with the money and he got him to work better. He satisfied his customers. He held on to the money. And it wasn't too long after that that he realized, well, wait a minute. Why should I fix someone else's pants? Why don't I just have parts made, fountain pen parts made to my specification? put my name on and sell it. And that's what he did. And that was actually the beginning of Parker Penn. Uh, that was in 1888. George was 25 years old. And so George was on the way. No, he wasn't on his way to traveling, but he was getting there. Because the company kept getting more and more successful. His biggest problem was that he needed to find a way to expand his market, to grow outside of Janesville. Uh, there was a ready solution in the Myers House Hotel in Janesville, where he lived, in that it was a home for lots of traveling salesmen. So early on, he <coughs> tapped into that resource and convinced some of those salesmen to represent him and uh, sell Parker pens outside of that area. Well, that was extremely successful. He had, he had to share a little money with the salesman, but that's okay, because the, the orders increased and increased and increased, and he became, he was becoming quite successful. So successful that in 1900, <coughs> he decided it was time to take a trip. And he went and obtained his first passport in 1900. And he went to the Exposition Universelle in Paris. That is the equivalent of the World's Fair in Paris. And he actually had a display space there, sold pins there. It was a huge, huge change for the business. But it was, it was deeply, deeply satisfying to George because he found that he could travel, he could feed his passion for travel and his passion for pens at the same time. That is how Parker Penn got started outside the U.S. Among the many lessons he learned <laughs> in Paris and in his future travels, was that, uh, was that his pens wrote in any language. Um, this is a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a deceptively simple idea. Uh, of course they write. They don't care what shapes or uh, combination of letters you, you write with it. But what George, what appealed to George was, he realized, well, there isn't anywhere on this planet that I can't sell Parker pens. That's a huge, huge market, he realized. And so with that in mind, he set about his plan to see the world with uh, renewed vigor. But, as I said before, he, his travels came to an end in 1937 when he died. 
But by that time, Parker had subsidiaries in all of these countries. So that's quite an accomplishment when you think about it. Uh, the first subsidiary was established in Denmark in 1903. Then came Great Britain in 1910, Germany in 1928, and a Passelmore. Every single one of them were places that George had personally gone and established the business. And I think it's safe to say that when he crossed the Mississippi River in Dubuque in 1871 on his way to his new home, he must have looked down that river and said, boy, I'd like to know where that goes. And in large measure, that is why today, in fact, ever since George died, Parker Penn has derived more of its revenues outside the United States than inside the United States. When I say that he was passionate about traveling, I, I'm at a loss to explain just how passionate he was. He visited China six times, mm -hmm. Japan four times, South America three times, uh, Europe more times than I've been able to figure out. He, he was just a relentless traveler. <coughs> and to this day, for example, in Great Britain, if you surveyed citizens of Great Britain, and ask them, Parker Penn, have you heard of it? They'd all say, yes. And they'd say, if you ask them then, well, uh, is it an English company or an American company? And they would say, oh, it's English. <laughs> Absolutely. Partly that's because they've been there for such a long time. Partly, of course, it's because George's oldest ancestors came from England. But mostly it was because George's curiosity and his love of meeting and talking to people meant that the business that he had developed was a very personal business. It was a relationship business. It was based on a handshake. And it was a very successful one at that. So the, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm quoting this example for you is, may not be obvious, and that is that we hear all the time about people who are very, very passionate uh, about one thing or another in their, in their lives. And, and that's great. I mean, I'm one of them. As I've said, I'm a one-trick pony. I'm, I'm very, very passionate about pens. And that's great if you have that. But, but there's another way. And it's the way that George and later his son, Kenneth, whom I'll talk about in a minute, they found a way to combine their passions. George combined his passion for travel along with his passion for pens. And I'm convinced that it's that combination of passions that yielded uh, a, a name and a brand that is now successful all over the world. He didn't as I said, he didn't really plan to get in the pen business. He, wa he just wanted to travel. But when he found, when he discovered pens, and he realized that it was, as he said, that it would always be possible to make a better pen, he had hit upon a combination uh, that was both satisfying and very successful. So now I'd like to add my grandfather Kenneth, his youngest son, to the story. As I said earlier, George and his wife Martha had two sons, Russell and Kenneth. Both were very, very different children, as any parent will tell you. But their differences were something that they found a way to make work. So while Russell, the elder, grew up to be a highly organized, methodical, 
uh, gregarious person. My grandfather, Kenneth, the younger, grew up more private, more reserved, but very creative. As they got older and joined the business, there was no butting of heads because they were, after all, so different. Elder son Russell was the heir apparent uh, because in George eyes, George's eyes, he was the more business-like of the two sons. And so when, for example, when World War I came around, Russell became a supply sergeant, managing supplies for the Army. By contrast, by marked contrast, Kenneth joined the Navy and promptly signed up to become a naval aviator. Hardly a safe and secure position. Planes back in those days were basically flying death traps. But it was exciting, and he wanted to do it. That was the beginning of Kenneth's first passion, other than Penn's. He was crazy about flying. There he is as a naval aviator. But when the war was over and it was time for him to choose a career, he had a tough, he had a tough choice. He wanted to become an airman pilot. And if he had, I think it's probably safe to say I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but uh, instead, he decided that he would join the business world, and so he took his first job working for Lord and Thomas Advertising Agency in Chicago. Lord and Thomas was the largest advertising agency anywhere at that point in time. And of course, uh, by no coincidence whatsoever, they were Parker Penn's advertising agency. So he started off learning advertising. And he really liked it because it was creative. It let him explore new ideas. So now we come to a period of time when George and Kenneth are both now working for Parker Penn. Russell is a vice president in charge of production and scheduling. Kenneth is director of advertising. At this particular point in time, Penn's, including Parker Penn's, are either black or black <laughs> or black. Any, just, just like the Ford saying goes, any color you want as long as it's black. Well, as the story goes, George is off traveling in the Far East on one of his many trips, and a very insightful salesman working in Spokane, Washington, came to Janesville knowing that George was away, and approached Kenneth and Russell with an idea. He said, what if we made a pen that wasn't black? <laughs> well, being young, young businessmen, and being as George was a long way away, <laughs> they said, that's an interesting idea. Let's explore it. So this salesman by the name of Tebbles had come up with an idea for a color that involved using on-hand materials, and but he wanted to combine the red with black ends. So they said, well, okay, sure, why not? Uh, so they had some samples made up, took them down to Chicago, to some pen stores in Chicago, and did some uh, impromptu market research. They did it over a period of two days and sold every single one of the pens that they'd taken with them. Well, it, you didn't need much experience to know that this was, wow, this was a really good idea. People really liked it. Keep in mind, this was the 1920s. So anything goes. And a bright red-orange pen, definitely that did. Had something that people were very interested in. But they were a little concerned about what George would say when he came back. 
and with good reason. George came back and he blew a gasket. <laughs> it was not the sort of Parker pen that he felt Parker should be selling until he saw the sales figure. <laughs> and he changed his mind quite abruptly. And so Parker then started marketing this, uh, this red orange dual fold, uh, and it was extremely successful. It was, in point of fact, in retrospect, I can say it was the pen that put Parker Pen on the map, not just in the US, but everywhere. Everyone won. So there were soon competitors. Everyone said, well, if Parker can do it, we can do it. They hadn't anticipated that Parker had planned ahead for that and had developed a variety of other colors. Lapis blue, jade green, and this very striking yellow pen, which demonstrates how George had changed his opinion. The, what's, known, what's now known as the Mandarin Yellow Duofold was actually developed, the color was developed from a vase, a cloisonne vase that George bought in Japan. So going from naysayer to color to how about this was pretty remarkable. They were all very, very successful, especially the Mandarin Yellow. But knowing that other people could do that, Parker then added to the mix a variety of sizes of pens for whoever, whoever wanted one. If it was a lady and she didn't need a clip, then they would put a ring top on it so that uh, she could uh, put it on a chain or a ribbon and wear it around her neck. If, if they wanted it to fit in their pocket, well, okay, we'll make a small one that'll fit in the pocket. And it went on and on and on. And Parker's, became, I mean, they were just monumentally successful. Until, <laughs> well, no, let me save that for later. So here we have, here we have Kenneth, who's now uh, 27 years old, same age as my son. And he meets a beautiful young lady in Chicago while he's down doing his advertising work. Uh, named Mildred Gapen. <coughs> and they marry <coughs> and start a family. And a little background on Mildred. She, uh, she was an art consultant in Chicago. Now, you might wonder what that is. Well, if you were a business, for example, a bank, as I gather this building once was, uh, then you would want to have some sort of artwork in there. Well, if you did, and you were a banker, you didn't know anything about art. So you would go to someone like Mildred, an art consultant, and you would tell her about uh, what you, the sort of feeling you wanted to convey, and she would say, I know just the artist for you. And she would introduce them to a bank, to, to an artist, and they would work out, and and the art would be created. And she knew a lot of artists, certainly all over Chicago, but even beyond. So where does this fit in everything you might wonder? Well, <laughs> early on in their relationship, they had a child. They had one child, my father, Dan. And Kenneth was dealing with a big question. Parker was going to be coming out, was planning to come out with another new dual But this one, unlike the other ones, which were priced at the stratospheric price of $7.50, this was going to be $10. Okay? Very special materials, very unique. Each pattern is completely unique. Just an amazing pen. They felt like the market could stand it and that it would further differentiate them from their competitors. So Kenneth's role in, all, in the new pen was to figure out how to advertise this new pen. And so he and Mildred started talking about who would be the right artist to 
create the artwork for this new advertising campaign. And they talked about a number of different options. Uh, the one they settled on, temporarily, was a guy you've probably heard of by the name of Norman Rockwell. <laughs> and so Kenneth wanted to go meet him. And he wanted to talk to him. Okay, so what are your ideas? How would we do this? And so they, Kenneth and Mildred, along with little two-year-old Danny, uh, went to go see Rockwell. And as it happens, Rockwell was working on the Saturday evening post cover for the Christmas edition, 1927. And wouldn't you know, that's the cover. What you may not know is that the little boy there is my father, Danny. <coughs> well, let's just say that uh, the Kenneth and Mildred really liked the approach. Well, they really liked the painting, too, because they wound up buying that. And, and that original is still in the Parker family. Uh, but Kenneth was really pleased with Rockwell's approach. And he also was pleased they were aiming for a Christmas release. So another Christmas theme, he thought, would be just perfect. And in point of fact, that's the ad that he developed. And if your eyesight is good, you can probably recognize that pearl and black billfold in his hand, where he's making a list of gifts for good boys and good girls. So that was the beginning of, of Kenneth's exposure to art and pens was hardly the last. Later on, in the 1950s, Parker would go back to Rockwell, and they commissioned him to make three different ads for Parker's then current Parker 61 model. This is one of those ads. And these, uh, the original artwork for these is owned by Parker Penn still. So, getting back to Kenneth's passion for airplanes, he was, uh, here he was, he was, he was married, he had a child, he had a job. He really shouldn't be thinking about anything else in his life. But there was this relentless, nagging passion for airplanes. And so he said to himself, yeah, I wonder if there's a way for me to combine airplanes with Parker. And what he settled on turned out to be one of the most inventive and creative campaigns that Parker ever came up with. He said, let's, he said to Parker's executive committee, let's buy an airplane. And they all said, are you nuts? An airplane? What are we going to do with an airplane? He said, well, we're going to paint it like the dual-fold pen. And then we're going to use it for advertising and promotional campaigns all over the U.S. And so they said, you know, that might be a good idea. After all, Lindbergh had just crossed the Atlantic. There was a lot of interest in aviation. And they reckoned, you know, it probably would be kind of hard to miss an orange plane. <laughs> so they agreed. So the order was placed, and the plane was painted, and then it made in uh, New York State on Long Island, and then it flew out first to Chicago, where Kenneth had arranged for it to be christened. And that is Amelia Earhart, along with Kenneth, christening the airplane. That was the beginning of a long relationship between Kenneth and Amelia. Uh, she came to Janesville several times in the ensuing years, and uh, they talked airplanes pretty much nonstop. So with, uh, as you can imagine, there was quite a bit of press associated with that. This photograph, several other variations were all over the newspapers. That was a pretty good send-off for the Parker airplane. But with that done, it was time to put it to work. And for this, the, plane, the plan that Kenneth had devised involved hiring a full-time pilot and mechanic 
to fly from point to point, from market to market around the U.S. And in each stop that had been scheduled ahead with the local Parker salesman, rides were offered. Free rides were offered in the Parker plane. Furthermore, if you were the mayor of a town that was coming, that the plane was visiting, you had a guaranteed ride. Your, probably your first ride in the airplane. They would also do things like coupon drops. Drop a coupon for a free bottle of ink. Uh, and yes, even pen drops. So they, Parker had just come out with their new first unheard of plastic uh, material for the dual fold. It was unbreakable. It was dropped from 3,000 feet, picked up, and it rode just like this. And so it was a successful campaign. But as time went by, the dual fold star started to fade. It, it, it had been around since 1921, and they decided, Kenneth and Russell and George decided, you know, let's just freshen it up. What we now call in the pen business a refresh. <coughs> so for this, Kenneth went back to Mildred because she had provided him such a great contact with Rockwell and said, Do you know an artist that we could talk to who could help us fine tune the shape of the dual fold? And she said, I know just the guy. He's in Chicago. His name is James Caddy <coughs> Newell. And so James Caddy Ewell worked with Kenneth in developing this much slimmer, much more trim dual fold that became known as the dual fold streamline. Kenneth obviously named it because of his interest in aviation and his great interest in streamlining aerodynamic shapes back in those days. It was it was successful. It kept the dual fold fresh. Uh, for another few years. Along the way, James Caddy Ewell also helped Parker design some desk sets. He had a background both as an illustrator and as a sculptor, and it was in his interest in, in sculpture that, that Kenneth was most interested in. This is, uh, this is probably best described today as the holy grail of desk sets. Um, at its time, in 1929, this desk set sold for $250. If you recognize that the dual fold was one of the most expensive things you could buy at $750, and that this one had two, well, you can imagine that $250 was a staggering amount of money. As a consequence, there aren't too many of them left around today, but when you do find them, they can cost thousands of dollars. I don't think it's any coincidence that uh, it's named the Spirit of Aviation, or that the figurine there is building an airplane. I think that's Kenneth's way of fanning the flames, you might say. So, here we are in 1929. Uh, at this point in time, Parker's humming along beautifully. Everything is rosy, especially the fact that George's original partner, who had bought a 50% business, percent stake in the business for $1,000, was ready to retire and wanted to cash out. So Parker worked with lawyers and stockbrokers, and Parker Penn went public in 1929, offering their stock on the Chicago Stock Exchange. Everything was, as I said, everything was rosy, except that we all know <laughs> what came next. And that was definitely not rosy. So even uh, with, the, with the refreshed dual-fold streamline, it was pretty clear that the dual-fold was fading. Uh, to give you an indication of how the depression hit, uh, you can see these sales numbers with precipitous declines year by year. The 
One saving grace, of course, was that the Duofold success up till then had left <coughs> euphemistically significant cash reserves. That meant that Parker was in a very, very solid financial position, uh, which was great. These are some notes from uh, a journal that Kenneth kept during, the, during that time, and I'll let you choose which ones to read, but I would, I would suggest that you notice the decline in dividends that went by. Keep in mind, this is just over one year, and it was before the really worst of the Depression hit. Significant declines. But in the midst of all of this, Kenneth already has his mind on a replacement for the dual fold. And his opinion was, we need a replacement, hang the depression. In fact, his feeling was, we need a replacement now because of the depression. In other words, he felt that the, the depression was the perfect time for Parker to develop a completely new path. Now that may seem crazy in the face of declining dividends and sales, but he reckoned that no other pen company was in a position to do this. And if Parker was successful in developing a new pen, when the depression ended, Parker would be head and shoulders above everyone else in the pen business. Well, it was not an easy thing to do. Uh, they did purchase the, the patent that's mentioned in here by a guy named Dahlberg, and, and that was great because it was a, it was a like, like all Parker pens, it was a, a real improvement over the past pen. The improvement, and simply put, was since people didn't like to fill fountain pens, even the dual fall, because it was messy and left ink on their fingers, the goal was to make, a, to make a pen that needed to be filled less often. And yes, if we can make it a little easier, that would be good too. So that's, that, that was the technical side. That's what they wanted to do. But Kenneth had more in mind. There was what it looked like. That was just as important. So he hired this guy by the name of Joseph Platt on Mildred's recommendation. He had a pretty good CV. He had been a student at the Parsons School of Design. He's considered one of the original design contributors to the now ubiquitous Parsons table. He had been a Paris correspondent for Vanity Fair, Vogue, and Huxley Garden. That meant he knew his way around style and design. He was working for the Marshall Field Company in Chicago as their head of design for home furnishings. And, oh yeah, he was one of the 15 original founders of the Society of Industrial Designers. Sounded pretty good, so he invited uh, Mr. Platt to come to Janesville and, so they could talk about some ideas. The two men hit it off immediately. They were the same age, a lot of their backgrounds were very similar, they really hit it off. So that was encouraging. And this is that pen, the Parker Vacuumatic, which was released in 1933. And it's remarkable for several things. One, uh, on the technical side, it held 102% more ink than the Duofold. But it also has, marks the first appearance of the Parker Arrow on the clip. That was an idea worked out between Joseph Platt and Kenneth. Kenneth wanted something that was dynamic and something that, that people would look at in a positive way. Actually, his first idea was he wanted to put an airplane clip on it. <laughs> and I think we can all thank the stars that that didn't work out. Instead, they settled on the arrow. Uh, that is, uh, and that today is Joseph, one of Joseph Platt's 
real claims the fame. Development of the, of the vacuum attic was certainly very challenging uh, because the depression didn't get easier for quite a few years. But uh, when the depression did lift, the vacuum attic was hugely popular and no one else had anything like it. Again, they didn't leave anything to chance. They developed a variety of colors and a variety of sizes. And this is just a smattering of the colors and sizes that were developed over the years. Oh yeah, one other thing I forgot to mention about Joseph Clant. You may be aware of one of his other pieces of work. He designed all the interior sets for Gone with the Wind. But along the way, as if the Depression wasn't bad enough, uh, Kenneth's older brother Russell died very unexpectedly. He was just 39 years old. And uh, this shook George's world in a, in a big, big way. Because George was looking to Russell to take over. George was, at, Russell was, after all, the responsible uh, son. He was the son that he could feel comfortable leaving the business to. Not the wild, thrill-seeking, airplane-spinning, creative Kenneth. Well, so that was out the window. It wasn't going to be Russell. It had to be Kenneth. And just four years after Russell died, George died. But by that time, Parker was doing extremely well extremely well. They were head and shoulders above any other pen company because of the vacuum attic and because they had developed other ways to withstand the depression. For example, the most significant of which was they, they developed and sold pens throughout the depression that, to companies like Woolworth and Sears. Now, don't think for a second that any of those pens had the Parker name on it. They did not. Kenneth was insistent that that not be the case. We don't want to do anything to sully our reputation. These were cheap pens. But they did keep revenue coming in, and they also had the effect that Parker had to lay off almost none of their employees during the Depression. This was something that George was insistent on doing. He believed that Parker's, well, I was going to say employees, but he actually called Parker employees associates because he believed that Parker's success was due to everyone's work, not just his. And he wanted to do everything he could to make sure that they held on to them. So, with all of that in mind, George is dead, his brother Russell's dead, now it's just Kenneth. And he becomes Parker's next president at just 38 years of age. And uh, Kenneth is now ready to, believe it or not, even though the vacuum attic is still very successful, he wants to develop another pen. Recognizing that everyone else, all the other pen companies, are going to be chasing the vacuum attic. If he immediately moves to replace the vacuum attic with something different, then they're going to be left behind again. A very strategic thinker, this aviator. So he began work in 1939 on a pen like, like a pen from another planet. He didn't want it to be like anything else the world had seen. Partly because he wanted it to be his pen, not a compromise of his ideas and George's ideas and Russell's ideas. But partly because he believed that 
a number of factors were contributing to the need for a complete rethinking of the, of the uh, fountain pen. Not surprisingly, one of the issues that he was convinced was important was the fact that more and more people were traveling by airplane. So he felt that it was important that uh, future fountain pens should be, as he put it, airplaneized. In other words, they ought to be developed so that they were resistant to leaking as air pressure went up and altitude went up. He also had developed uh, over the years uh, kind of his own personal design ethic of what he thought uh, was good design. And that was the 51, which was released in 1941 just as the Second World War was starting. Uh, so the timing wasn't great for the release of the 51, because one of the first things that happened was that the Wartime Production Board said, uh, Parker Pen, well, pens aren't exactly critical to the war effort. Oh yes, they're important, we have to have them for soldiers so that they, their morale can be kept up with letters home and, and so on and so on. But we're going to have to restrict pen production so that you can do something that is more crucial to the war effort. That turned out to be rocket fuses. Um, which was really actually quite a good fit for Parker given the skills of its employees and the machinery. It was, uh, it was a good business. In fact, uh, a number of other pen companies also made rocket fuses during the Second World War. Parker was somewhat unique, though, in that all of the fuses that Parker sold to the government were sold without profit. No profit whatsoever. Kenneth insisted on it. And he, ins and he, and he encouraged the government to inspect their books to make sure that there was no profit in it. He did not want a profit from war. So, the, with a slow start, the 51 started growing in popularity. Of course, additional colors and sizes were developed, and Mildred was a critical piece in choosing colors. But she felt that there were just some colors that you don't put on a classy, expensive-looking Parker pen. So, if you see a red in here, it's a very subdued red. These are all uh, early 51 colors. And uh, colors became, and still are, uh, an important issue in designing a park. <coughs> Mildred's not around, but she definitely <coughs> had her mark. But, of course, Kenneth's interest in aviation was still going strong. So as soon as the war was over, Parker Penn bought uh, an airplane, and uh, it was one of the first uh, post-war deliveries from the Beechcraft factory in Kansas. And uh, you can see that the design, uh, the paint design on it, was uh, quintessentially Parker. I don't know if you can see it, but right on the nose, right here, it says Parker 51, so that all the bugs out there would know what got it. <laughs> But really, Kenneth believed that uh, the planes like this one were an important part of Parker, Parker's public <coughs> visibility. Yes, it was, it was nice to be able to save time uh, in moving from point A to point B, especially since Janesville was still not the center of the world. <laughs> but it was also important that when you did travel, that uh, the way you traveled made a very positive statement. So they were always spotlessly clean, aside from a few bugs on the nose, and uh, with beautiful paint, paint designs on them. Now this particular one actually has a direct parallel to a Parker pen, because Kenneth worked with a local uh, sign painter in Janesville to develop this paint design, and liked it so much 
that he said, well, let's do a pen that's like it. So this became the first of a continuing series of pens. I don't think they're called flighters today, but uh, the, the basic idea of the of the bare aluminum airplane with uh, gold accents. Um, a highly, highly collectible Parker 51 these days. He's a flighter. So then we come to advertising the 51. And for this, Kenneth turned again to Mildred and said, who do you think we should use? And they had many, many long discussions about the sort of look that they wanted. And as it happens, one of their favorites was his artwork was, a, was readily visible almost anywhere on a newsstand. This was Boris, and I'm going to butcher his name, Art Sebashev. Now, if, if it's not a name that, uh, that hits you, uh, I'm not surprised. But back in the day, <coughs> he created the artwork for over 200 copies of Time magazine. He was extremely well known. This is one example. This is another wartime example. And here are a couple of examples of uh, his artwork during the Second World War. The addition of morale. This was uh, this ad was a special favorite of Kenneth's because of the airplane and because of the completely coincidental uh, naming similarity between the Parker 51, the P-51, and the North American P-51 Mustang, which was winning the war uh, for the U.S. in Europe. And indeed, they do have more in common than their name. So, here's a little background on the 51. Development took two years, beginning in 1939, and it cost the then staggering sum of $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars. It was truly a complete rethinking of the fountain, both from a functional point of view and from an aesthetic point of view. Initial production, and as I said, was restricted by the by the war and the wartime production ban. It was on sale for look at those dates. That's 31 years, staggering period of time. No one really knows exactly how many 51s were produced over the years, both in Janesville and all over the world. But estimates are up to 300 million tons, a staggering number. And I dare say. A lot of those 51s are still in use today. So it was named the fourth best industrial design of the 20th century by the Illinois Institute of Technology. And it is part of the design collection at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Wow. So that's all good, but here's something more recent that you might... Uh, enjoy reading. For those who can't see it, I'll read it for you. Ask most serious pen enthusiasts, and they'll probably return only one answer. The greatest pen ever made? It has to be the Parker 51. Released in 1941 by the Parker Pen Company, the 51 was streamlined, functional, and crafted with the artistry of a Renoir. Imagine the writing utensil equivalent of the most perfect Apple product. No, multiply times 10. That was the Parker 51. Well, I, it, I can't argue with that. I, 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 just, I just can't. <laughs> but, I mean, that's incredible praise. But for me, I, I, I like the praise that it gets, but it's, it's a little more personal for me. Because... As, as corny as this may sound, I cannot look at a Parker 51 and not see my grandfather. It's just not possible for me to do. Um, as an example of that, um, let me pull out one of my things here. 
So, and I'll tell you a little story about it, because there's always a story behind it. So this Parker 51 set, black with uh, gold caps, uh, was made in 1948. How do I know that? Because Kenneth told me one day, when I was 16 years old, that the day that I was born, he got up from his desk, and he walked out onto the production floor, and he picked out a Parker 51 set, black with gold caps, for me. Took it back to his desk, put it in the bottom left drawer, and resolved that he would give it to me when I was 16 years old. So, there are, as I said, there are lots of stories behind 51s, behind any pen, really. Um, this is a very personal one, and it speaks directly to why I just can't argue with any of this uh, praise. <laughs> so, along the way, it turns out there was another uh, fan of the 51. Some of you may have heard of him, some, I'm guessing most of you probably haven't. Uh, Hungarian-born, multifaceted artist by the name of Laszlo Mahalinagi. <coughs> I'm really not qualified uh, to give you an artist's perspective on, Laha, on Mahalinagi. But I can tell you that based on what little I do know about him, he's now considered to be a giant in artistic design in the United States, and in fact the world. He cut his teeth on the, what was known as the Bauhaus movement in Germany the 1930s promptly escaped before the Nazis came to the U.S. and set up a school in Chicago called the uh, Institute of Design. You may not have heard of that either. You probably haven't. Um, but the teaching staff and the students of the Institute of Design is a who's who of, des of design in the U.S. during that time. People like Frank Lloyd Wright, people like Mies van der Rohe, people like Walter Gropius, huge, huge names in art. And again, the connection is this, this giant in design called up the Parker Pen Company one day and said, this Parker 51 is really remarkable. Who did you have designed it? And the answer was Kenneth Parker designed it. Mahali was staggered, staggered that uh, a lay person, a businessman, could design such a beautiful piece. But he did. And he and Kenneth got to be very close friends. And they actually got also to be working partners because. Well, Holly was so impressed with the design ethic, not just Kenneth's, but throughout Parker Penn at that point in time, that they agreed that Mahali would send his teaching staff and his students to Parker Penn to work with Parker Penn in designing all kinds of products. As a consequence, any number of patents and trademarks uh, resulted from this partnership as well as desk set designs that are in the modern, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, packaging designs, typography, even advertising, all over the place. Kenneth also owned uh, two pieces of uh, Mahali's uh, art himself. His favorite uh, is this one, uh, which used to hang over Mahali's desk until Kenneth persuaded him to sell it to him. Uh, Mahali died quite young. He was uh, 51 years old when he died in 1947. And uh, it, was a, it was a real loss for Kenneth. Certainly it was a loss for the art world in general. Um, but uh, Kenneth just couldn't 
stand the idea that this piece of art, which he saw to describe his friend Mahalan, uh, should be in private hands. He wanted the whole world to see Mahalan. And so he donated uh, this artwork to the Milwaukee Art Museum, where it still hangs today. Uh, the other piece he has is uh, in my living room. <laughs> so post Mahali, uh, the relationship uh, with the Institute of Design continued. Uh, as Parker moved towards the ballpoint era, uh, a former institute uh, student by the name of Nolan Rhodes came and helped design the Parker Jotter that I'm guessing a lot of you already still have. That's because Parker Jotter is by far the most successful Parker pen of all time. If you measure by years in production, it is still in production today, 60 years after it was first released. It is essentially unchanged. And there was another gentleman by the name of Don Doman, who was also a former institute student and also uh, an alumni of the Raymond Lowy Design Studio in Chicago. He and Kenneth and my father worked together to design more current uh, pens such as the Parker 61, 45, the 75, the VP, and the T1, all between 1956 and 1970. So, now you have a better idea of what Parker pen history is, the personal side of it. If you look up a definition for passion, you'll see something to the effect that it's a strong affection or enthusiasm for an object, concept, etc. And I think that does a pretty good job of describing it. But if you look carefully, it hit me, it may hit you, that it refers to an object, a single object or concept. What I want to, the thought I want to leave with you all is that George and Kenneth combined their passions in such a way that they not only enjoyed very personal and very rewarding results, but that it wound up to be something uniquely themselves. That's, again, why I look at a 51, any 51, my 51, your 51, and I see Kenneth. So, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the idea that you should seek out your passion and that you ought to follow your passion. And I think that's great advice, but I think it only goes halfway. If you can find a way to combine your passions, you are going to wind up with something very personal, very unique, and very satisfying. George and Kenneth did it. Uh, I'm happy to explain it to you all. And that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Absolutely delightful and wonderful. So when you hold one of these, even this little inexpensive keyboard jotter, you're writing with a piece of American history and now you know all about it. Uh, our, our speaker will uh, be around for a little bit and we'll, uh, I think we'll be holding answers. Uh, but uh, please uh, um, come, on, come on up and why don't you ask from up here? I think uh, that would probably be the best way to do it. People who do have to leave can, can get out.